the warning passages of Hebrews. The applications by Dr. John Owen in his commentary on Hebrews. An evil heart of unbelief, Hebrews 3.12. There is need of great care, heedfulness, watchfulness, and circumspection for a due continuance in our profession to the glory of God and advantage of our own souls. A careless profession will issue an apostasy, open or secret, or great distress. Matthew 13, 5 and 6. Song of Solomon 3, 1 to 5. Our course is a warfare, and those who take not heed, who are not circumspect in war, will assuredly be a prey to their enemies, be their strength never so great, one time or other they will not avoid a fatal surprise. And there is a necessity of this heedful attendance in us from the manifold duties that in all things and at all times are incumbent on us. Our whole life is a life of duty and obedience. God is in everything to be regarded by us so that we are to be attentive to our duty on all occasions. Psalm 16 verse 8, Genesis 17 verse 1. If we fail in matter, or manner. What lies in us we spoil the whole. Any one defect is enough to denominate an action evil, but unto that which is good there must be a concurrence of all necessary circumstances. Ephesians 5 verses 15 and 16. And who is sufficient for these things? God alone by his spirit and grace can enable us hereunto. But he works these things by us as well as in us, and gives heedful diligence where he gives success. But it is with special reference to difficulty, oppositions, dangers, temptations, that this caution is here given us to be cautious. And who can reckon up the number or dispose and to order these things? And that whether we consider those that constantly attend us, or that are occasional. Among opposition, snares, and dangers, that we are constantly exposed to, and which without heedfulness we cannot avoid, the apostle here instances in one, namely, that of an evil heart of unbelief, which we must speak about. And he gives an instance in those that are occasional, Ephesians five fifteen and 16, Walk circumspectly, because the days are evil. There is a special evil in the days in which we live, which we cannot avoid without great circumspection. Now this taken heed consists, number one, in a due consideration of our danger. He that walks in the midst of snares and serpents and goes on confidently without consideration of his danger, as if his paths were all smooth and safe, will one time or other be entangled or bitten. Blind confidence in the course of profession, as if the whole of it were a dangerous road, is a ruining principle. First Peter 1 verse 17 Proverbs 28 verse 14 A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22, verse 3. It is the highest folly not to look out after dangers, and which usually ends in sorrow, trouble, and punishment. Fear is necessary in continual exercise, not a fear of distrust or diffidence, of anxious scrupulosity, but of care, duty, and diligence. Continually to fear dangers in all things brings a useless, perplexing scrupulosity where men's principle of duty is only a harassed, convinced conscience, and the rule of it is the doctrines and traditions of men. But where the principles of it is the spirit of grace, with all this fear there is liberty, and where the rule of it is the word, there is safety, peace, and stability. Men at sea that are in the midst of rocks and shells and don't consider it will hardly avoid a shipwreck. Livy tells us that Philopemen 
that wary Grecian commander, wherever he went, though he were alone, he was still considering all places that he pained by, how an enemy might possess them, and lay ambushes in them to his disadvantage. If he should command an army in those places, by this he became the most wary and expert captain of his age. So should a Christian do. He should always consider how, where, by what means his spiritual adversaries may ensnare or engage him, and so either avoid them or oppose them, and not be like to simple pass on heedlessly and be punished. Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12. and so Number 2. In the due consideration of the special nature of those dangers that we are exposed to, it is not enough that in general we know and reckon on it that we are obnoxious to dangers, but we must learn what are the special dangers as things or circumstance in our lives, callings, ways, times, and seasons that are apt easily to beset us, to know and continually ponder their nature and advantages. This is wisdom, the greatest wisdom we can exercise in the whole course of our walking and profession. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He that takes heed in this will not likely fail in any other instance. But here, custom, security, false pleasing, confidence of our own strength, negligence, and sloth, all put in to delude us. And if we are here imposed on, that we weigh not aright the nature and efficacy of our own peculiar snares and temptations, we assuredly at one time or another fail and miscarry in the course of our obedience. This was David's wisdom when he kept himself from his own iniquity. Psalm 18, verse 23. God would have us cast all our care about earthly things on him, but be watchful ourselves, through his grace, about spiritual. But we are apt to fail on both hands. Number three. It is so to heed them as to endeavor to avoid them, and that in all their occasions, causes, and advantages, in their whole work and efficacy, but to watch against all ways in which they may so do. This is the duty of a man that stands armed on his guard. He is very regardless of his enemy who never seeks to avoid him, but when he sees him or feels him, men will consider the lion's walk so as not without good means of defense to be found in it. The lion is in all the special oppositions we are exercised with. We had need continually to be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, as Second Samuel 23, verse 7, and yet to avoid them when we are able. God expresses his great dislike of them that walk contrary to him, as we have rendered the words, Leviticus 26, 21. If you walk with me at a peradventure, or at all adventures, carelessly, negligently, without due consideration of your duty and your danger, this God will not bear. Consider them so as to oppose them. And this consists in these things, first, in being always ready, armed, and standing on your guard. Ephesians 6.13, Mark 13.37, 2 Samuel 23.7. Secondly, in calling in help and assistance, Hebrews 2.18 and 4.16. Thirdly, in improving the supplies granted us with faith and diligence. And these are some of the things that belong to this duty, and they are but some of them, for it is diffused through the whole course of our profession, and is indispensably required of us if we would abide in the beauty and glory of it to the end. And therefore the negligence and sloth of many professors can never enough be bewailed. They walk at all adventure as if there were no devil to tempt them, no world to seduce, ensnare, or oppose them, no treachery in their own hearts to deceive them. And hence it is that many are sick, and many are weak, and some are fallen asleep in sin. But what our Savior said to all of old, he says still to us all, watch. Mark 13, verse 37. Number two. There are the persons concerned in this duty. Lest there be in any of you is somewhat more emphatical than the lest whereby alone we render it. Lest perchance with respect unto a dubious event. Or lest there be at any time 
lest so that there should be in any of you. The apostle does not seem in these words strictly to intend every individual person, as if he had said, let every one of you look to himself in his own heart, lest it be so with him. But he speaks to them collectively to take care that there be none such amongst them, that none be found amongst them with such a heart as he cautions them against. And this consequently falls on every individual. For where all are spoken to, everyone is concerned. The same kind of expression is used to the same purpose, Hebrews 12, 15, and 16. Watching, overseeing mutually with diligence, lest any among you fell of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, is Esau. Here the caution is evidently given to the whole church, and the duty of the whole is expressed thereon. So is it likewise in this place, as appears from the direction that he gives for the right performance of this duty in and by mutual watchfulness and exhortation in the next verse. This then is proposed, number one, to the whole church, to the whole society, and consequentially to every member thereof, so that we may hence observe godly jealousy concerning and watchfulness over the whole body that no beginnings of backsliding from Christ and the gospel will be found amongst them is the duty of all churches of believers he that first put in an exception to this rule was a first apostate from God who did it to cover a former sin Says Cain in Genesis 4, verse 9, Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my duty to look after him, to take care of him? Or what becomes of him? God proposed a question so to him, as it was apt in its own nature to lead him to confession and repentance. But he was now hardened in sin, and having quarreled with God and slain his brother, he now casts off all the remaining dictates of the law of nature, accounting that one brother is not bound to take care of the welfare of another. Mutual watchfulness over one another by persons in any society is a prime dictate of the law of our creation, which was first rejected by this first murderer, and every neglect of it has something of murder in it. 1 John 3, 11, 12, and 15. In a church relation, the obligation to this duty is ratified by institution. Upon the officers of the church it is incumbent, by the way of office, on all believers as members of the church. In a way of love, Leviticus 19.17 You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. He that does not watch over his brother to prevent a sin or recover him from it. As much as lies in him, he hates him and is so far a murderer. And the necessity of this duty is expressed in the word used to declare it and the manner of its usage. Rebuking thou shalt rebuke him, that is, plainly and effectually, and that with such rebukes as consist in arguings, reasonings, and pleadings to bring on a conviction. So the word signifies and is used as to the pleadings or reasonings of men with God to prevail with him. Job 13.3 Surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason or argue and plead with God until I can prevail with him. And it is used of God's pleading with men to bring them to conviction. Isaiah 118, Go to, or come now, and let us plead together, so that an effectual dealing with a brother about sin is included. And this is enforced in the latter clause of the words, which may well be rendered, and you shall not bear iniquity for him, that is, make yourself guilty of a sin by not reproving him. And for that jealousy which is to accompany this watchfulness and the effects of it, our apostle gives in an example in himself, Second Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I fear, lest by any means your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This belongs to their watch, as they watch for the souls of their people, as they who must give account, Hebrew thirteen seventeen. The discharge of this duty will be required of them on the account of their office, and that when, I fear, some will be hard put to it for an answer. For the scripture is full of threatenings and denunciations of sore judgments against those that shall be found negligent in it. But this 
Did this excuse other believers, members of churches, from a share and interest in this duty? No, without a doubt, unless it renders them canes, that is, transgressors against the light of nature, and who is to the institutions of Christ, manifest themselves not to be members of the same mystical body with them that really believe. For in the observation of this and the light duties of their common interest does the preservation of that body consist. Christ is a head from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, makes increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians 4.16 Every joint, every part in this mystical body that receives influences of life from Christ ahead, and so holds of him is to work effectually and to give out the supplies which it receives from Christ to the preservation, increase, and edification of the whole. There is indeed a causeless suspicion that some are apt to indulge to, instead of this watchful jealousy. But this is the bane of churches and of love, as that is the preservation of them both. The apostle places this word, evil surmises or suspicions, among the works of men of corrupt minds, 1 Timothy 6, verse 4, and that deservedly. But this godly, watchful jealousy is that which he commends to others in the example of himself. And whatever appearance they may have one of the other, they may be easily distinguished. Jealousy is a solicitous care proceeding from love, suspicion of vain conjecturing proceeding from curiosity, vanity, or envy. He that has the former, his heart is ruled by love towards them concerning whom he has it. From thence he is afraid, lest they should miscarry, lest any evil should befall them, for love is a willing of all good to others, that they may prosper universally. Suspicion is an effect of curiosity and vanity of mind, whence commonly there is somewhat of an envy and secret pleasing in the miscarriages of others mixed with it a fault too often found amongst professors, and this vice puts forth itself in vain babbling and unheedful defamations, whereas the other works by love, tenderness, prayer, and mutual exhortation is in the next verse. Again, this jealous watchfulness has for its end the glory of God and his gospel with the good of the souls of others. This is that which the apostle aims to ingenerate and stir up in the Hebrews, as is evident from his discourse when vain suspicion has no end but the nourishing of the lusts from whence it proceeds. The foundation whereon this duty is built is a common concern of all believers in the same good or evil, which are the consequence of men's abiding in Christ or departing from him, in reference whereunto this jealous watch is to be ordered. Take heed, lest there be among you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The good that will ensue on the avoidance of this evil is twofold, the glory of Christ and the salvation of the souls of them who make profession of his name. And have we not a concernment in these things? Is it not our concernment that Christ be glorified by the professed subjection of the souls of men to him and their perseverance therein, that his name, his grace, his power be glorified in the holiness, fruitfulness, and stability in profession, of all that are called by his name, if we are not concerned in these things, if we are not deeply concerned in them, we are none of his. In like manner are we not concerned that the members of the same body with us should be kept alive, kept from putrefying, from being cut off and burned before our eyes? Are we not concerned that an eye does not go out, that an arm does not wither, that a leg be not broken, yea, that a finger be not cut? If it be so, we are not ourselves members of the body. The like may be said of the evil that ensues on the sin of apostasy, which in this duty we labor to obviate and prevent. That which principally of this kind might be insisted on is a troublesome, defiling infection, and which apostasy in any is intended, which our apostle speaks to, Hebrews 12:15. The failing as one is commonly the infection and defiling of many. There is a filthy leaven and apostasy, which, if not carefully heated, may leaven the whole lump. Oftentimes also it springs from or is accompanied with some word of air that eats like a gangrene. And a duty spoken to is one signal means of the prevention of this evil. 
And in this lies our concern, as also in the preventing of that punishment that may befall the whole of the sins of some, Joshua 22, 18, and 20. And it is a defect which is in this and the like kind of duties which manifests and makes naked that miserable degeneracy which Christians in general in these latter evil days are fallen into, who almost has any regard to them. Instead of these fruits of spiritual love, men for the most part follow divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. The practical duties of Christianity are amongst many derided. To watch over one another, to warn, to exhort one another, are looked on as things, if possible, beneath contempt. And it is a shame to mention or report the ways and means of dealing with and about the sins of men, which by some are substituted in the room of those appointed in the gospel to their utter exclusion. But the rule is stable, and will in due time, through the strength of Christ, prevail against the lusts of men. Observation number three. It is the duty of every individual believer to be intent on all occasions, lest at any time or by any means there should be found in him an evil heart of unbelief. This, as was showed, follows on the former, and is a necessary consequence of it. But this so directly falls in with what will be offered from the next clause, that thereunto we refer it. The evil thus earnestly cautioned against is expressed. The principle of the evil is an evil heart of unbelief. What is meant by the heart in the sense in which it is here used was declared on the verses preceding. What is meant by evil shall be showed in its proper place. In special, it is said to be an evil heart of unbelief. That is, most say, an evil heart and incredulous or unbelieving. An evil and unbelieving heart. So the genitive case of the substantive is put for the adjective by a Hebraism not unusual. In this sense, unbelieving is either exegetical, declaring what is meant by the evil heart in this place, even an unbelieving heart, or it is additions, and so a heart is signified which in general is evil, in particular unbelieving. But there seems to me to be more in this expression, and that here denoting the principal efficient cause rendering the heart so evil is that it should depart from the living God. An unbelieving heart, for this latter word is sometimes used to express a defect in believing and not unbelief absolutely. So John 20 verse 27, be not unbelieving, but believing. They are the words of Christ to Thomas, who though he failed in his faith, yet was not absolutely without faith. I confess the word is generally used in Scripture to express a negative unbeliever or an infidel, but there is something peculiar in this expression, a heart of unbelief, that is under the power of it, principled by it in its actings. What this unbelief is, and how the heart is rendered evil by it, we must now inquire. As for unbelief, it is usually distinguished into that which is negative and that which is privative. First, negative unbelief is whenever any man or men believe not or have not faith, although they never had the means of believing granted unto them. For when men believe not, they are unbelievers, whether they have had any means of believing or not, or whether their unbelief be culpable or not, whatever may be the nature or degree of its demerit. So the apostle calls him an unbeliever who comes in accidentally to the assembly of the church, who never heard the word preached before, 1 Corinthians 14, 23 and 24. In this sense, all those persons and nations who have never had as yet the gospel preached unto them are infidels or unbelievers. That is, they are so negatively, they don't believe, but yet cannot be said to have in them an evil heart of unbelief. Secondly, it is privative when men believe not, although they enjoy the means of faith or believing, and in this consists the highest acting of the depraved nature of man. And it is on many accounts the greatest provocation of God that a creature can make himself guilty of. For it is, as might be manifested, in opposition to God and all the properties of his nature, and in the whole revelation, his will, hence the gospel, which is a declaration of grace, mercy, and pardon. 
Though it condemns all sin, yet it denounces the final condemnation of persons only against this sin. He that believeth shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Mark 16.16 16. The root of this unbelief is in the original deprivation of our natures with that spiritual impotency and enmity to God in which it consists. There is such an impotency in us by nature that no man of himself by his own strength can believe, can come to Christ. So himself informs us in John 6:44, No man, says he, can come to me except a father draw him. That is, none can believe unless they are in a special manner taught of God, as he explains himself in verse 45. Again, by nature, that carnal mind is in all men, which is enmity against God, which is not subject to his law, neither indeed can be, Romans 8, 7. Hereunto may be referred all that is spoken about the death of men in sin, their blindness and distrust, their alienation from God, and obstinacy therein. This is a rude and remote cause of all unbelief. Men in a state of nature neither can nor will believe the gospel. But secondly, besides this general cause of unbelief when it comes to particular instances, and the gospel is proposed to this or that man for his assent and submission to it, there is always some special corruption of mind or will voluntarily acted, if the soul be kept off from believing, and on the account thereof, principally and not merely of original impotency and enmity against God, is the guilt of unbelief reflected upon the souls of the sinners. There is the same fundamental remote cause of unbelief in all that refuse the gospel, but the next immediate proper cause of it is peculiar to every individual unbeliever. First, some are kept off from believing the gospel by inveterate prejudices in their minds, which they have taken in upon corrupt principles and interests. This shut up of old most of the Jews under their unbelief. They had received many prejudices against the person of Christ, which on all occasions they expressed, and so were offended at him and believed not. Secondly, there is an unbelief that consists in a rejection of the truth of the gospel after that it has been admitted, acknowledged, and professed. Some, after they have been convinced of the truth and made profession of it, yet through the temptations of the world, the corruption of their own hearts, love of sin, or fear of persecution, allow their convictions to wear off, or cast them out, and reject the faith they have owned. Hereof is frequent mention made in the gospel, and no less frequent caution given against it. And this in general is the highest aggravation of the sin. For although the former kind of primitive unbelief will certainly prove destructive to them that continue in it, and it may be said that this can do no more, yet this has two great evils attending it, that the other has no concernment in. The first is, the difficulty that there is in being recovered out of this condition, he who has already withstood the efficacy of the only remedy for his distempers, who has rejected and despised it, what can cure him? This he who never received the gospel, be he never so bad or sinful, is not obnoxious to. He has not as yet, as it were, made a trial of what it is, and is free from that contempt cast upon it which is done by the other, who declares that he has made trial of it, and values it not. This, on many reasons, renders his recovery difficult, almost impossible. Again, there is a degree of this unbelief which puts a soul absolutely into an irrecoverable condition in this world. For wherein soever the formality of the sin against the Holy Ghost that shall not be pardoned does consist, yet this is a manner of it, and without which it is impossible that there any one should be guilty of that sin. There must be a renunciation of truth known and professed, or the guilt of that sin cannot be contracted. Now this be they never so wicked, they are free from who never received, admitted, or professed the truth. The sin against the Holy Ghost is a sin peculiar to them who have made profession. And from this arises an especial aggravation of their punishment at the last day. So the Apostle Peter determines this manner. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, and after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them, Second Peter 2.21. Again, this unbelief in rejecting the gospel is either notional and practical, or practical only. 
Titus 1.16 talks of men who walk in some kind of profession, yet their end is destruction, and that because their God is their belly and their glory is their shame, who mind earthly things, Philippians 3.19. The corruptions of such men do absolutely prevail over their convictions and the power of sin in their wills and affections, cast off all influencing light from their minds or understandings. Such men as these, although they do not in words deny the truth of the gospel, yet they yield no obedience to it. They neither expect any good from its promises, nor fear any great evil from its threatenings, which formerly had made some more effectual impressions upon them. And this is the condition of unspeakable multitudes in the world. Now the unbelief here intended by the apostle is this primitive unbelief, consisting in the rejection of the truth of the gospel after it has been received and professed. And this also may be considered two ways, as to some degrees of it, and secondly, as it may be finished and completed. The first consists in any declension of heart from Christ and the gospel. This may be in various degrees and on several accounts. The latter is a total renunciation of the gospel of which we spake before, it is a former that the apostle here intends, and therein a prevention of the latter, and therefore concerning it we must consider two things, first, in what it consists, or what are the ways of its entrance into and prevailing upon the minds of men, by what means it renders the heart evil when it is brought under the power thereof. It consists in the soul's receiving impressions from argument and reasonings against profession in the whole, or any degrees of it. Satan is and will be casting fiery darts at the soul, but when the shield of faith is held up constantly and steadfastly, they are immediately quenched. Ephesians 6.16 Yea, it is a work of faith to arm the soul on all hands, that assaults make no impression upon it. If that fail, if that faint, more or less, they will take place. And when or wherein the soul is brought but to parley with an objection, then and therein unbelief is at work, whether it be as to a particular fact or as unto our state. It was so with our first parents in the very entry of their treaty with Satan, and given a considering audience to that one question, has God said so? Our great pattern has showed us what our deportment ought to be in all suggestions and temptations. When the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them to tempt him with, he did not stand and look upon them, viewing their glory and pondering their empire, though he was fully assured that after all he could despise and trample upon the offer, and him that made it. But instantly, without stay, he cries, Get thee hence, Satan, and further strengthens his own authority with a word of truth, which was his rule, Matthew 4.10. Innumerable are the inclinations, objections, temptations that lie against the profession of the gospel, especially in times of difficulty, particularly against steadfastness and preciseness in profession. That the whole of it be laid aside, or the degrees of it be remitted, is a great design of Satan, the world, and the flesh. To hearken to what Satan suggests, though but under a pretense of seeing what is in it, to reason with the world, to consult with flesh and blood, contains the first actings of unbelief towards corrupting the heart in order to a departure from God. Secondly, it consists in or acts itself by a secret dislike of something, notionally or practically, in the gospel. This was a common thing in the hearers of our Savior. They disliked this or that in his doctrine or teaching, and that sometimes in things concerning faith sometimes in things concerning obedience. So did those with whom he treated John 6. Whilst he taught them in general of the bread of God that came down from heaven, they were pleased with it and cried, Lord, evermore, give us this bread, verse 34. But when he began to acquaint them in particular that he himself was that bread, that his flesh was meat and his blood was drink, that is, that they were the spiritual nourishment of the souls of men, especially as given for them in his death, they began to be offended and to murmur. They disliked it, crying, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? And what was the effect of this dislike? Plain and open apostasy, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with them. And whence did this dislike and murmuring arise? 
It was merely the acting of their unbelief, as our Lord declared in verses 63 and 64, My words which you so dislike are spirit and life, but there are some of you that don't believe. You pretend exceptions against my words, apprehended in your gross and carnal manner, but the true reason of the dislike of them is your own unbelief. God, he says, has not as yet given faith unto you, for I told you before that no man can come unto me, that is, believe in me in the gospel, except it were given unto him of my father, verse 65. And this, in this does your unbelief act itself. This is a matter of faith, and we have an instance to the same purpose in the matter of obedience. The young man mentioned, Matthew 19, had a great respect to the teaching of the Lord Christ, for he comes to him to be instructed in the way to eternal life. And this he did with so much zeal and sincerity, according to his present light, that our Savior approved them in him, for it is said he looked on him and loved him, Mark 10, 21. And he likes his first lesson or instruction according to his understanding of it very well. But when the Lord Jesus proceeded to make a particular trial of him, and in a special instance, bidding him sell what he had and give it to the poor and follow him, he didn't like this but went away sorrowful, verses 21 and 22. Now, there are three things in the gospel and the profession of it about which unbelief is apt to act itself by this dislike, which, if not obviated, will prove a beginning of turning away from the whole. First, the purity and spirituality of his worship. Secondly, the strictness and universality of its holiness or obedience. And thirdly, the grace and mystery of its doctrine. These are some of John Owen's applications and exhortations upon Hebrews. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to his great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.